man. It is so exciting to be here. Look at this. I feel so tall. This is so unique, man. This is once in a lifetime opportunity. Well, Forefront, it is a blessing and a privilege to be here in the house of God. Amen? All right, come on. Now, we got to nip this in the bud right here. Now, when we say amen, it literally translates to so be it. So when we say amen, it means we know this to be true. So when I say it is a blessing and a privilege to be in the house of God one more time that so many people around the world don't have, this is true. Amen? amen. There it is. All right. Now we're awake. Wonderful. All right. Well, this morning, I want to start off by prompting you to think of a moment in your life. Specifically, I want you to think of the moment where you first fell in genuine love with someone. Perhaps this is your now husband or wife. Perhaps this is the first real significant romantic relationship that you ever had. I want you to try and conjure up that feeling that you felt, right? Perhaps it was an instance where you were out at a super fancy dinner and it was super, super fun and super nice and you made a hilarious joke and you saw your significant other just laugh so hard that they spit out fancy wine out their nose. And it was the most disgusting thing you'd seen, but it was also the most adorable thing that you'd ever seen, right? Or perhaps you're, you're out on a date and you're, you're starting to get to know this person and something scary happens, you're out at a, at a movie or something, your hands kind of touch and you've got that moment where it's just kind of like that one second feels like forever. And you're like, oh my gosh, are we going to kind of pull away or are we, gonna, are we finally going to hold hands? Is this going to happen? Are we doing this? And there's that second. It feels like an eternity, but you both start to turn your hands and suddenly you're holding hands. And you've got this great eruption within you. It's like fireworks, right? And in that moment, you knew you were hooked. You knew that nothing was ever going to be the same from that moment forward. You knew you were in bad. Am I right? We can all, I think, picture the, these instances that we've had, but these instances don't just come in romantic relationships. In fact, I believe they also come in our spiritual relationships. Now, when it comes to my history, I've, you guys have been very welcoming, but I'd like to share some of how I grew up, right? I was brought up in a, in a Methodist household, and I mean, growing up, we, we went to church on Sundays, we went to church on the holidays, but most of my, my memories of going to church were getting woken up early by mom, she makes you put on the, the collared shirt and the tight pants and super uncomfortable shoes, and I was, not, I was not about it, right? Mom was always, you know, taking forever to get her hair ready, dad was waiting in the car, right, and he was super super impatient, ticking on the time, but that was how I was brought up. Christ was never something that was super important in my life. It was just somebody that I maybe acknowledged on Sundays or perhaps at a, at a youth group or a Bible study, right? But if you were to ask the people that were around me if I was a Christian, I don't know what they would have said. Do you? If I were to go, I mean, sure, the people in this room, they know you're a Christian because you're here because it's Sunday, right? But if I were to go to the people that you work with or the people that you interact with on a regular basis, would they know that you're a Christian? Would they know that you have been defined by forgiveness and the love that you've been given through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? That's the question I want you to ask yourself. Or is it what seems to be the most likely thing or what seems to somewhat happen a lot of times in our romantic relationships and in our spiritual relationships is we put Jesus in something of a box, right? We, we invite him into our lives. We had these revelatory instances, but then we kind of limit him, right? We, we put him in this tiny box and we, we only take him out on Sundays or on Wednesdays or when it's convenient or when it's easy. Or maybe you just take him out when you've been blessed, right? This is the issue I want to address because as many of you saw here about two weeks ago, we welcomed seven new brothers and sisters into our heavenly family, right? Can I get an amen for that, right? Amen, right? We welcomed in seven new brothers and sisters into our heavenly family and they have experienced that new life in Jesus. But that came from a moment where they fell in love with Jesus. And in that moment forward, they were meant to have a totally new life but I feel like what often happens is we have this, this great high where we invite Christ into our lives. We invite Jesus to redefine who we are. And then maybe it's a few weeks, maybe a few months, maybe it's years or even decades. But somewhere along the way, you just kind of fell into the habit of allowing Jesus out only in the instances when it's convenient. Only in the instances when you were surrounded by the right group of people. The people that you knew that perhaps wouldn't judge you or that would be okay with it. Because the worst thing that could happen is we offend someone with our faith, right? 
But luckily, we see this instance occurring here in the Bible, actually. Last week, we had the the privilege of hearing Ron talk about Jacob and how he was just this this terrible trickster, right? I'll give you a, a quick recap. Now, Jacob was brought up, and he actually tricked his brother out of his inheritance, right? He tricked his brother out of his inheritance by offering him just a bowl of soup. Because he was starving, and he was like, oh my gosh, dude, I'm so hungry. I think we've all felt that craving before when you really just need some food. And he was so hungry, he was like, all right, I'll give you some food on the condition you give me your inheritance. And so his brother Esau obliged, right? But then he also went off and went so far as to coat himself in the fur of an animal because his brother was just that hairy, right? We're not subtweeting anybody. But his brother was just that hairy, and he went to his, who his father, who was becoming blind and old and sick, and he covered himself in this fur to seem like his brother, and he swindled his brother's, inher- he swindled his brother's blessing from his father, right? And so he had done all these things, and when Esau found out, man, was he mad, right? He was livid. So much so that he was actually prepared to kill his brother Jacob. And so, being mom's favorite, mom came to Jacob and said, listen, you're in a terrible situation. You need to take what you can and go. Get out of town as fast as you can because your brother's coming for you, right? Jacob was terrified in this moment. I mean, I know, I'll I'll share a little bit. I've got an older brother, and he is much taller than I am, all right? He is like 6'3". I know, some people often ask if he's adopted or something, but he's a lot taller than I am. And, I mean, I knew if he was coming after me with murderous intent, I would be absolutely terrified. And so I can identify with how Jacob felt. And as he was running, that's where we start this story today. When he's out running for his life, his mom actually said to me, she said, hey, I've got a brother out towards the east. I want you to go and find him. His name is Laban. And so that's where we begin our story today, where Jacob is running in Genesis chapter 28. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to to open them now and to see the true word of God so that you know that I'm not just making this up, right? (laughs) I'll give you a second to open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 28. And if you don't have your Bibles, the the scripture will be reflected on the screen as well as I'll be reading it out for you. All right, so we're in Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, where Jacob is out, he's on the run, he's heading towards the land of Laban, and he's he's out sleeping under the night stars, and this is the instance where God appears to Jacob in a dream, and here's what he says, right? In Genesis chapter 28, 15, God says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until... Until I have done what I have promised you, right? So God comes to him a dream, and I want you to pay attention to this phrase, I am with you. It's the first thing God says to Jacob, I'm with you. And so Jacob wakes up, and he's like, oh my gosh, what a crazy dream, right? And he goes, and he, he says in Genesis chapter 28, verse 20 through 22, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to the wear that I so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So God appears to him in a dream and says, I'm going to be with you, Jacob. I'm going to be with you through thick and thin, all of it. And Jacob says, all right, God, you're going to be with me. I'm with you. We're on a team. Let's go. Let's conquer the world. I imagine this was an instance of something like a church hire right after you get baptized. He's excited. He's ready to conquer. He is ready to represent the kingdom. And perhaps that's how you felt the first time that you accepted Christ into your life. The first time you fell in love with God is when you were so excited and ready to go. But then what does he do in the very next verse? He sets up a pillar. He builds a box. And he puts God inside the box. And he just kind of leaves him there. Right? And this is where we, we begin this journey of transformation. And perhaps this is where your journey of transformation this morning begins as well. Perhaps you are putting God in a box the same way that Jacob has, right? But let's see how God takes Jacob, transforms him, and actually uses him to father the 12 tribes of Israel, right? As we continue on, we see that Jacob moves from this place, and he goes on an adventure. Now, this isn't just any adventure. This is the quintessential adventure. In fact, if we were to look at this in in today's instances, you might call this the American dream. Right, he goes off, and just a few days, maybe it's a couple weeks later where he's traveling, he sees an absolutely gorgeous 
girl, right? And I mean gorgeous girl. He sees this woman named Rachel, right? And he falls in love with her. And he said, hey, I'm coming to this area. They start chit-chatting, you know. Maybe he gets her Snapchat. Maybe he DMs her on Instagram or something. Who knows? But they start chatting. And, you know, he starts asking her about, hey, what do you do? What you get? You out here getting some water? It's a hot one, isn't it? Right? And that, she's like, yeah, until he asked her about his family, trying to get to her. And she's like, yeah, my dad's name is Laban. And he's like, what a coincidence. I'm actually coming out here to meet Laban because he is actually my uncle. Well, what a small world, isn't it? Right? And so he, can, and he goes to meet Laban. And he's like, Laban, listen here. I am absolutely head over heels in love with your daughter. And Laban sees this as an opportunity to kind of capitalize on that love, right? He kind of puts Jacob to work. He's like, all right, I hear you. You want my daughter. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'll make you a deal. You work for me for seven years, and I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage. That's working the, working the land. That's caring for the flock. And Jacob's like, all right, bet. Seven years, that's easy, right? No big deal. I mean, who wouldn't work for seven? I mean, most of the time, a lot of time, I won't say most, but a lot of the time, you know, we end up dating our significant other, our now uh, husband or wife for about, you know, a good couple years. So it's understandable. So Jacob works for seven years with a smile on his face, man. It's hard work. It's not easy, but he's going after it. He's chasing it because he's got this dream, this dream of being with this wonderful girl. And the seven years finish up, and Jacob's like, all right, I'm done. It's time for the goodies, right? It's time to get married. And so they have this big wedding ceremony, and Jacob, it's so interesting. We actually see the swindler get swindled in this instance, right? Where he, where he had, like, swindled his brother, he swindled his father. Well, Laban actually pulls a fast one. Maybe it's, maybe it's genetic. Maybe it's part of the family, right? But what happens is he goes, and he goes through this whole mar- wedding ceremony, and, of course, his bride is veiled because he's waiting for this big unveiling moment, where this big moment where they're finally together as husband and wife, and they're able to consummate their marriage. And the next morning, he wakes up, and he realizes, wait a minute, this isn't Rachel. This is actually her older sister, Leah. How crazy is that? I mean, I would be absolutely livid, right? He went through all of this stuff. He worked for seven years. He married this girl. I mean, he's already, they're bound. It's done. It's over. And he realizes this is not the right person. And so understandably, he goes to Laban and he's like, yo, what's up with this, man? Like, what's going on? He's like, well. You see, it's it's not always super under like it's not always super customary to marry off the younger sibling before the older. But here's what I'll do: in a week's time, you can go and marry Rachel as well, on the condition that you work for another seven years, right? Oh my gosh, that's so. For my math whiz in here, that's seven. Plus another seven means 14 years for this girl. Now, Jacob, I imagine he's a bit frustrated, but he agrees, and he does so. So seven days later, he marries Rachel, and, you know, all is good, but now he's got another seven-year debt to pay. And so he stays, and he does the work, and throughout this time, there's sort of a debacle where he's, you know, he's with his one wife, he's with the other wife, and they're, they're kind of fighting back and forth, but they start having kids, Right? They start having kids, and throughout this period, Jacob actually, ends, or Jacob actually ends up fathering 11 children in this instance. Now, I say 11 because we will see the 12th child emerge later on in the story. But he's fathered 11 kids, and at the end of these 14 years, he realizes, man, I got a lot of mouths to feed. Right? I got a lot to take care of. I got a lot of responsibility. And so he goes to Laban, and he's like, hey, listen, you know, I've, I married both of your daughters. We've now got 11 kids, right? How am I going to care for them? And so Laban does another fast one, the third and final fast one, where he offers Jacob. He said, look, you can have all the spotted animals and lambs of my flock if you work for another six years. So now this is some pretty high math. This is some pretty high math. But if you take seven plus another seven, right, we're at 14. Now what happens if you add six to that? Anybody know? 20, oh man, look at you guys, you passed, congratulations. So he works for 20 years for Laban, and at the end of that 20 years, man, he has accomplished the American dream. He's got the girl of his dreams, he's got all these kids, he's got this land, he's got financial capital, he's got everything that he could probably want, right? I mean, it seems like he's got it all. Right? He's got the money, he's got the girl, he's got the kids. His legacy is insured, but yet something isn't quite right. Something just isn't the same because Jacob has actually done what a lot of us do sometimes in our lives is he has taken a good thing and turned it into a God thing. 
He's taken this beautiful, what could have been such a beautiful relationship with Rachel, and he's made it an ultimate thing. He's put it on a pedestal where God actually belongs, right? He's looked to Rachel to define him, right? He's looked to his family, to his legacy to define who he is instead of letting the creator of the heaven and the earth define who he is. So we see how in this instance, God actually comes and emerges, right? Sorry, give me one moment here. Um, so Laban, understandably, actually looks at Jacob and he starts to resent him, right? He's taken his daughters, he's taken his land, so Laban gets a little bit mad, right? I mean, we all have our little, our little squabbles with the in-laws, right? I mean, who really gets along perfectly with their in-laws? So it's, it's understandable that Jacob might have a little bit of, of tension there. But so he goes and he, he takes his wives and his children and he leaves, right? Because God actually prompts him to do so. Um, as we'll see, I'm... One moment here. Um, So we see here in Genesis chapter 31, verse 11 through 13, at the end of all of this, when Jacob seems to have everything that he could want, God reappears, right? And in Genesis chapter 31, verse 11 through 13, God actually calls him to go back to his homeland. Now, if you'll read with me, in Genesis 31, 11 through 13, the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, or spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Jeez, man. Now he hasn't been back there in 20 years. I remember the last time he was back at his native land, what, what was happening? Why was he leaving? He left because Esau wanted to kill him. So God appears to him after 20 years and says, it's time to go back. Isn't it interesting how God, every every time God emerges to people throughout the Bible, he never asks us to do anything easy, right? God never comes to me in a dream and is like, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go order an extra large meat lover's pizza. And I want you to eat that whole dang thing all by yourself. I want you to stomach, I want you to body it. I just want you to sit there on the couch, shirt undone, and just eat and cover yourself in grease and just have a darn good time. God is never asking me to do something so easy, right? Every time he emerges, he emerges asking us to do something difficult, In fact, if you were here a few weeks ago, we even talked about the importance of the Sabbath, right? And to me, if you know me, that is one of the most difficult things I feel like God has actually called me to do, is to take a breath, to sit and to stop working and to trust that God is going to take care, right? So what I want to ask you is what maybe God is prompting you to do something that's just a little bit difficult, right? Something that you might not really want to do, because if you listen hard enough, God will push you outside of your comfort zone, right? And so if he's not pushing you outside of your comfort zone, perhaps you're not listening hard enough. Perhaps you're not really listening to what God has for you, right? There's a wonderful quote by Deval Guder that says, the only thing that is stopping you from where you want to go is your comfort zone, right? The only thing that's stopping you from getting closer to God, from growing in your faith, is your comfort zone, Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you the instance where you know it is time to step out of your comfort zone, where you are willing to give up comfort, is the instance where you are going to grow the most. Right? Amen? Amen. 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 Right? So let's come back to Jacob. Jacob is absolutely terrified, but yet he's going back to his homeland, back to Esau. Right? He's going back, and he's, by all means, he's going to his death. He's going to be murdered, and it's through these, these days, these weeks, that we see a refinement. I mean, can you imagine getting up every morning with your, friend, with your family, with your kids, with your livestock, and marching willingly to your death? Man, this was a time of renewal. This was a time of reform where we see Jacob transforming from someone who has only been pursuing the American dream, who's only been pursuing the pretty girl, the long legacy, the financial capital, to someone who's pursuing something a little bit more. 
Now, in this instance, we see in Genesis 32, verse 11 through 12, that he offers a very powerful prayer that I want you guys to, to read with me, right? So if you've got your Bibles, Genesis 32, verse 11 through 12, which says, Save me, I pray, for the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid, and he will come and attack me, and so the mothers of their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper, and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted." Man, hear what Jacob is saying in this instance. He's saying, God, I am absolutely terrified. I don't know how I'm going to overcome this giant. I don't know how you're going to use this. I don't know how I'm ever going to make it through. But I remember what you said. I remember the promises that you made. Right? I remember that you said you would be with me. Forefront, some of the reason why we are struggling in our lives, some of the reasons why we don't think we're going to be as successful as we could be is because we're not remembering the promises that God has made us. We need to be well equipped with the word of God so that when these instances of trial come, we are prepared. We are ready because we remember the promises that God has made. And God is always faithful to the promises he makes us. Amen? Amen, right? So we see that this is no longer the same guy. This is somebody who's totally different. Now, let me ask you, what has changed? What do you think has changed from this? Well, let me, let me tell you, we see the, the, on the eve before he's to go and to meet Esau, we see this incredible personification of what Jacob's been going through when God himself actually appears to wrestle with Jacob, Right? I want to encourage you guys to open your Bible. We're gonna, I'll, I'll paraphrase this, but it's in Genesis 32, verse 22 through 32, where we get this exciting narrative where Jacob is actually wrestling with God, right? where God emerges. He says, I need some time to myself. right? And so he sends his wives, he sends his children away, and he's in this instance of solitude where God shows up and they wrestle all night. And he wrestles with Jacob, or God wrestles with Jacob. Now, I want you to pay attention to the particular verbiage in this instance. The word says that he wrestled with Jacob, with and not against. Now, the Hebrew term that's used here is im, and of the 965 times that this Hebrew term is used throughout the Bible, 94% of those instances are actually translated specifically as with. So we know the vernacular in this instance is very specific, right? So you might be asking yourself, self, so whenever I say self, I need you guys to say self. So you might be asking yourself, self, what's the difference between wrestling with someone and wrestling against someone? What's the difference between wrestling with someone and wrestling against someone? There it is. Well, I'm so glad you asked. Please allow me to explain with a little bit of a story, right? Whenever I was living in Oklahoma, as many of you know, I did the majority of my undergraduate studies at the University of Oklahoma. And when I was doing that, I actually lived, one of my roommates was a college wrestler, Right? His name was Aaron, and he was a great guy. He was five foot seven, just pure anger, man. If you've ever met a wrestler, they're real tiny guys, but man, they're powerful, and they love to wrestle. And there would often be instances where I would be woken up in the middle of the night even sometimes when he would be in our living room wrestling with some of his buddies. Right? And I'd come out, they'd be covered in bruises, they'd be covered in scratches. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what, why are you doing this? What is the point? This looks so painful, right? And so I, I'd ask him, why are you putting yourself through this? It doesn't make any sense to me. And he said in, the, in these instances where he was wrestling with his teammates, these were some of the most challenging times because they were both exerting themselves so much that they wanted to challenge each other, that they wanted to grow, right? It wasn't that it was easy, but it was that it was purposeful, right? The things that he was going through, these challenges that he was facing, the struggles, the cuts, the bruises, they were all for a reason. There was now a purpose to this struggle, Right? And this is what God does in our lives. Right? When we follow Christ, it's not just that it, it's going to be easy. We're not just going to have the, the time of our lives and coast through and you know, drink soda and eat pizza all day every day. It's going to be hard, but the difference is the purpose. There's finally a purpose in our suffering. There's finally a purpose in our pain. Forefront, I've got to tell you, there is no growth without a little rain. Anytime there's, there's a plant, there's something that's trying to grow, there must first be a storm to give that plant life. How else would it grow into the strong tree that it is today, right? There has to be a storm to birth our greatest progress, right? Purpose always comes through pain, right? And so 
we see, I want to ask you guys today, what is it that God is, is calling you to grow in? Right? What is it that God's challenging you to do? What is it that God is challenging you to step outside of your comfort zone with? Right? I want you to stop wrestling against God and start wrestling with God. The next time you're, you're struggling and you see that God has given you an opportunity to grow, I want you to ask yourself, why? Why is he doing this? What is the greater purpose of why this is happening? You see, a lot of times I often find myself praying, God, give me wisdom. But what does God do? He doesn't just snap his fingers and make me wise. Instead, he gives me an opportunity to gain wisdom, right? Sometimes I pray, God, make me strong. So he gives me a burden to strengthen myself. I say, God, give me an opportunity to to achieve the financial capital that I need to bring glory to your kingdom. He gives me opportunities to work and to earn it and to grow, right? God is not a genie in a bottle. He is going to give you everything that you need to grow. You need to be willing to put in the work. And some of us today are just complacent with putting God in a box and with not doing the work, right? But here's something that, that, that's so interesting is that whenever G- Jacob finishes wrestling with God, God actually rewards him in this. And he rewards him by naming him, right? Jacob receives a new name, a new identity. His new name is Israel, Right, some of you might know this is actually the namesake where we get the nation of Israel today, right, out in the Middle East, is, is from Jacob's being renamed. And what's so significant about naming is naming does two things. I want you to follow this with me. Naming demonstrates the authority of the namer, and it denotes the destiny of the subject, right? When God names us, he demonstrates his authority over our life, right, to change everything, to change our identity, and to change your destiny, Suddenly, when you receive this new identity, your whole life has been changed. It's like that moment when you first fell in love. Suddenly, the whole trajectory has has changed. It's turned, right? And so when God renames Jacob Israel, it means that his whole life, his destiny has finally been changed. But what are some of the names that God has named you and I throughout Scripture? Because don't don't get me wrong, God has named us incredible things, right? Mm. Now, I don't know if any of you are big fans of spoken word, but I'd like to share this little passage from um, a bit called uh, by Hosanna Poetry that talks about some of the names that God has shared, that God has called us. Now, in John 15, 15, he calls me friend. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, he calls me chosen. In Ephesians 2, 2, 10, he calls me his workmanship. He calls me his art. He calls me handmade. He calls me purposed and fashioned for good things. In Corinthians 6, 19, he calls my body a temple. He calls it the residence of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, 8, he calls me his messenger to the world. In Galatians 3, 26, he called me his child. In Romans 5, 8, he calls me greatly loved. In John 8, 36, he calls me free, free indeed. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he calls me brand new. Forefront, this is the word of God. Amen? Amen. 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 God has renamed you. You are no longer bound by the names that this world wants to call you. So when you hear ugly, that's not you. When you hear broken, that's not you. When you hear disgusting, shameful, prideful, all of these things, these no longer define you because we have a new name today. We have been renamed by the maker of the heavens and the earth. We have been named as the people who are called to bring his gospel to the world, to set his people free. Forefront, this is who we are. This is our identity, right? Amen. Amen. Thank you, right? And so one thing, now now I've got to enter into a quick caveat. One of my favorite shows are the long shows, right? I don't don't have any particular genre or anything, but I absolutely love long shows. And one of my favorites is Grey's Anatomy. Does anybody like Grey's Anatomy here? Man, I'm a huge Grey's Anatomy fan, right? Now, if if you're not familiar with with Grey's Anatomy, we follow this this young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed sort of nurse intern in the beginning called Meredith Grey. And she's phenomenal. She's just so, she's cute as a button, right? She's so fun. She's out here. She's loving people. She wants to serve. She wants to help heal the world, right? But this show goes on for, I'm pretty sure it's still going on. It's already got like 15 seasons out. I'm talking like 20 episodes per season. I'm talking 45 minutes an episode. Like you could start this and you could be watching this for years. It goes on and on and on and it's wonderful. And the same thing can be said for the Bible, guys. The Bible is a long, book. Amen. 
it is a huge, I mean, so much so that it is an impressive feat when we actually make it through it. People are like, you know what, we're going to, we actually had a plan. We're like, yeah, we're going to make it through the Bible in a year and a half, man. It's April and we're still on Genesis. So I don't know if that's going to happen, but we're, we're trying. We're, we're committed to it, right? It's awesome. And what's so great about the Bible is it's so long that even if you can manage to get through it, if you go back and read it again, it's going to be an entirely new book. It's going to teach you a whole new set of things, right? It's so brand, it's always new, it's always changing. And if you don't believe me, I'd encourage you to jump in and check it out for yourself, right? Take me up, call me out on it, right? But that's how the Bible is. We see these stories actually continue to grow and develop. We get to see these characters continue to grow because even though Jacob has been renamed Israel, he doesn't step into this identity immediately, Right? In fact, he actually kind of holds off, and the scripture continues to call him Jacob. Right, And in this instance, we actually see here um, in Genesis 35, 20, that something comes and something changes. Because even though he's been renamed, he still has something that's holding him back. Forefront, I want to suggest to you today, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, many of us, we might not be in this place where we've put God in a box. You're probably, a lot of us, in fact, I feel like this is most true in my own instance, that I take God out of the box. I'm doing what I can to take him out and to show him off, but there's still that one thing. There's still that one instance in my life that I haven't invited God into. There's still that one area of my life that I hold back. Perhaps it's a battle that you're just too afraid to lose, so you just don't bother to fight. Perhaps it's an addiction that you just, you don't think you can overcome, so you just kind of let it be and give up. And perhaps, you know what this really means? This means we don't have faith in God, that he is going to give us an entirely new life. Forefront, I want you to hear this right now. Jesus is not a supplement. Jesus is not a supplement to your life. He doesn't exist to purely improve portions of your life. Jesus has come to give you an entirely new life. Amen? Amen. Jesus is not a supplement. He's not here to just improve little bits and pieces. He is here to fully transform you into someone unrecognized. Somebody who's completely changed by the love and forgiveness that has been offered on that cross. That's who God is. That's who Jesus is. Someone who loves you so intensely. Somebody who is ready to change it all, to give it all just for you, right? And for Jacob, that one thing was Rachel. He was holding himself back because he knew there was still this one thing like, you know what, God, I trust you. I've been reformed. I've grown in my faith. But Rachel's just, oh, man, she is the thing. She is that one thing for Jacob that he was holding back. And I believe in the conviction of the Spirit. And I believe that there is something on your heart that you know, that unspoken word, that one small thing that you don't even hardly want to admit to yourself, that you know that you're holding back from God. Forefront today, I want to encourage you to let it go. And if you don't, God's resilient. God is going to come after you. Even after that 20-year gap, God still came back to Jacob, right? And so God comes back, and in Genesis uh, chapter 35, verse 20 through 21, we see an astounding instance where Rachel is giving birth to her final son, Benjamin, who will come back, and we'll, we'll talk about him later. But these 12 sons actually end up being the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel, and it's so remarkable how God uses Jacob to create this great nation, right? But then in childbirth, Rachel dies, That last idol has been removed by God. And in Genesis chapter 35, verse 20 through 21, we see that scripture says, Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar. And to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. But in verse 21, it says, Israel moved on. This is such a subtle change, but forefront, I don't want you to miss it, right? Jacob set up the pillar, right? He didn't deny the pain of the loss. He didn't deny the struggle that he was going through. But after he had put Rachel to rest, after he had given up that final thing, that was the moment when he stepped into his new identity. Israel, the man who wrestled with God, right? And forefront, I want to tell you today that the power of the Holy Spirit is that when you finally give up that complete surrender to God, that is the instance where you will finally be free. For those of us who have felt like we've been bound for days, months, years, decades, I want you to hear this truth right now, all right? 
you can be free. 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 You can be free from the bondage of sin. You can be free from that old life. You can be free from that old addiction. You can be free from your pride. You can be free from sin if you only surrender to God and allow yourself to be transformed by the sacrifice of the cross. A forefront, amen, right? Amen. You can be free, forefront. Now, I don't know where you're at today in your, in your journey. I don't know where you're at in your walk with Christ. Perhaps you're more like Jacob at the beginning, where you've, you've put God in a box, where you'd identify as a Christian. You know, when that sentence comes, you're like, yep, Christian, for sure. Now I've done my duty. It's so much more than that, right? We are called not just to put Jesus in a box and take him out when we're around the right group of people or take him out when we're in the right context or when we feel like it or when it's easy or when we're blessed. We are called to let Jesus fully take over our life and give us a new life in Jesus, right? So perhaps that's where you're at, where you just you put him in a box. Or perhaps you've taken him out in all these instances, but that one, that one thing that's on your heart in forefront, if there's one thing you walk away with today, it's this. You can be free. When you offer up your life as a living sacrifice to God, you become transformed by the renewing of your life, and nothing is ever the same. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Well, today, let's, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer, and if there, haven't, there hasn't been an instance where you have offered to God your, your life as a living sacrifice, when you have invited him to take over your, your whole being, every aspect of your life, to redefine you, to give you a new identity, I want to encourage you to do that today, to pray that prayer. And if that's, if that's where you're at this morning, come find one of us. We would love to pray with you. We would love to walk with you through this new journey that you're taking. And we would love to celebrate with you because this is a phenomenal and momentous occasion. So forefront, let's bow our heads and thank the Lord our Father for this day.